Hello friends, welcome back. Yeah, it's been over a month since we last posted. Life happens, and we've been busy. But that doesn't mean we haven't been recording and we've got some great guests coming up. But if you're new here, Exit Point is a podcast that explores life through the lens of some of the world's most extreme athletes with the intention to extract valuable lessons and insight. If you have been enjoying the podcast and would like to support our efforts, please consider subscribing on your favorite platform and leaving us a review. It really helps out by bumping us up on the search engines. And if you're really stoked on what we're doing, you can buy us a coffee. There's a link in the description. In this episode, we speak with Todd Shubotem, who's the co-founder and president of Apex Base, one of the premier manufacturers of base jumping equipment. Todd has been involved in the sport of base jumping since 1987. He's a designer, innovator, educator, film consultant, and with his brother Troy, was one of the very first commercial manufacturers of base specific equipment. So with that, let's get Todd on the track. Well, we appreciate you coming on to the podcast, Todd. I, I got to admit, it's uh, one of my, um, uh, it, it's, it's been one of, on the top of my list for the entirety of our podcast. Um, so thanks for joining us. Wow. Well, thanks for thinking of me and, and having me on. Yeah, I appreciate it. I've been enjoying uh, listening to the to podcast. You know, when you introduced me to it, I had to go and kind of uh, check it out. And uh, yeah, you guys are doing a nice job. Oh, thank you. So I'd love to jump in just by saying that my base experience, my base journey started by stepping into your shop, Todd, like, you know, early 2000s, um, I saw base jumping for the first time on a Chris McNamara movie, which we just interviewed him last week. And my next stop was to figure out like where I could get equipment. And so I walked into your shop on Paris Boulevard uh, and was like, hey, how do I, how do I do this? And your response was, well, you got to learn how to fly a parachute first. And I was like, okay, where do I do that? And you're like, all right, down the street, there's this place called Paris. I was like, okay, <laughs> but I'll be back, my friend. <laughs> and and uh, you were, and you were. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. Like every single day pestering you about how the equipment was going to get built. And uh, I was actually really appreciative that you took us through all of that. Um, my buddy Ian and I got to tour your factory and um, I think it was commonplace for you back in the day to just show people how everything got made from the, the lines to the designs. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just part of uh, enjoying what I do. And, and, and you know, I, I love to teach. Um, and, and when someone comes into our shop that just has an enthusiasm about what we're doing, you know, it's the toy store. Come see where it's made. Um, if someone shows just, uh, even if they don't show a lot of interest, I don't mind, you know, just walking them through and try to, uh, uh, you know, modify the tour just depending on their experience. And, uh, you know, if they're a rigger or something, they want more, you know, you know, tell me about more of those machines that you guys have and stuff like that. So it just, uh, is, is part of what we think is a, you know, a benefit to the community, you know, our friends, that's how we make, you know. Um, you make acquaintances and 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 show them kind of where it's where it's done it's not not a secret it's uh we build it right here and and this is how it's done this is how it starts this is some midterm stuff and yeah we we enjoy it i hope that uh is reflected in uh, you know we still offer you know free tours oh yeah and i love the new shop which is in Murrieta and uh, much nicer than the one <laughs> in Paris, which was a rad piece of culture because it was right down the street from the drop zone. So like you, know, you could literally bike over there. Uh, but the new shop is is a lot nicer. Well, thanks. Yeah, actually, that building in Paris has really interesting parachute industry history. Back in the 80s, it was a uh, home of Westgard. And then whatever, in the 90s, that was home of Rigging Innovations before they moved to Arizona all in the same building. So we were like the third or fourth occupant that was, uh, you know, parachute industry related. So there was a bit of history there. I bet you've had quite a few people come through your doors asking for base equipment and perhaps have developed a bit of intuition on whether or not these people were, uh, had the right stuff. What did you think of Matt when he first came through the doors? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, no. 
uh, enthusiastic, you know, Matt's, you know, that, that's still Matt, you know, it's, he's just enthusiastic and, uh, asking questions. And I didn't remember you not being a skydiver. Uh, so that's kind of a, a fresh one for me, but it's, um, yeah, you know, people come in enthusiastic and wanting to learn more. And, you know, I, I know I had a very similar and still do have a, you know, an enthusiasm for what we all are, are doing and how we recreate. Uh, so for the most part, you know, it's, it's, it's fun. It's refreshing. It's fun to see the people coming in. Uh, but yeah, there's been a lot of, a lot of different people who walk through our doors and, you know, you never know exactly how, uh, how their journey is going to uh, evolve. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's interesting. A quick follow up on that. You know, is there a commonality between like, let's say, let's take Matt, for example, you know, he's been in the sport for quite a while now, and I think he practices it in a way that we might both believe is fairly righteous. Is there a commonality of beginners that come through your doors that maybe forecast that they're going to be in it for the right reasons and handle themselves appropriately? Uh, interesting. Um, you know, we, we, as you guys know, we have a wide spectrum of people in our sport. Um, uh, most of us are a, a bit of... Uh, you know, thinkers, tinkerers, uh, you know, we like to know why, not just here, do this. Uh, so I see that as a, as a, as a common uh, factor. But, you know, some people are just uh, way more reserved, and you can tell they're just listening and they're watching. They're not asking as much. Uh, you know, people like Matt, you know, just a bit more outspoken and, and has, the, has that positive energy. Uh, but then you get someone like Jeb, who is just very, you know, you know, on a different, you know, different level where he, he's already got a mission kind of planned out. And I'm going, oh, my goodness, you know, or um, uh, a poly came through. And again, just another just off the rails kind of, you know, personality. Uh, uh, so there's definitely a wide spectrum. But for the most part, if you can kind of filter the, that, that part of the personality out, most of us just want to understand a bit more why. Now, I hear this is happening. I hear you guys are making a lot of jumps off of these. How, how, how can you do that? You know, a lot of them come to us with no reserve. Now they're more used to already kind of knowing that. But, you know, in, the, in those early days, you guys don't single parachutes? What, what, what? How is that possible? Uh, so I, I think, you know, if, again, filtering it out, it's just, a, in, you know, in, in just wanting to gain some knowledge, um, you know, very inquisitive. So on that, uh, I'd like to ask, you know, how does it feel uh, to have empowered several generations of jumpers to engage in something that's so dangerous and widely regarded as impossible? Um, at times it weighs heavy on you, um, you know, uh, trying to to do the right thing uh you know sell to the right people and, and or maybe it's more keeping it from the wrong hands you know you just every once in a while i get someone that's 14 years old and it's got a credit card and i come in in the morning and there's a you know a order sitting on the desk and you're like ah, let's let's follow up a little bit i don't know he's 14 but after a few emails and a phone call or two trying to kind of figure out what's up uh, so that uh, that's heavy because I don't want those to slip through. Um, uh, for the most part, it's it's pretty easy to to check up on on someone's activity, making sure that that they are who they are. Uh, so therefore, you know, selling to people that are already I already know in the community or a little more established uh, definitely helps. Um, uh, yeah, I you know, every once in a while I I look back and, and yeah I. I I enjoy my position in 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 our sport. I, I've really have enjoyed the community and 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 watching, uh, you know, watching us grow uh, and being able to, um, uh, you know, the more and more uh, you know events or activity that we see is is just, you know, I'm, I'm hearing of a, a building jump going gone in Ecuador and stuff, and you know, and and just you know just seeing that expand. Um, uh, obviously, just you know, a lot more jumps. Uh, Arizona's going off. Uh, and it's just it's it's fun to see uh, it continuing to to grow and not just you know we're not 
all having to play on you know, these really limited uh, numbers of, of objects. You can see as the sport is moving into like South America and stuff, there's getting to be more and more down there. And it's, so that's, you know, it's just a lot of fun to see that uh, activity continue and, and continue to grow. So it's uh, equal parts nerve wracking and joyous, like nerve wracking when you, oh, yeah. you know, consider that there are a lot of people that uh, have some red flags that you got to stay on top of and, uh, you know, temper their desire for base jumping. And at the same time, super joyous to see that you've empowered all of this expansion and uh, the human experience, getting to jump all these new objects and new places and push the, the line. Is that pretty fair? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 it, you know, it's, it's life. It has its ups and its downs. Uh, and so there's definitely some parts that are very exciting. I mean, it's, it, you know, the, you know, parachutes and nylon, it's been really good to me. It's, uh, um, in, in so many ways, it's, it's fulfilled a lot of, uh, you know, desires that I've had, uh, to be independent and, and to give back and, you know, to travel and just so many different things. And so being able to share those, experiences with, uh, uh, you know, with the community and, and seeing the changes and fortunately seeing some of the bad sides of, of, of what can happen, but it, it keeps it real and helps you, you know, wake up with the, the next day to have a, you know, a direction and, 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 a, you know, and, and stick to your gun sometimes when you, when you know you have to speak up. Uh, it's not easy sometimes, but um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I've enjoyed it a lot. With that, I'm wondering if we could take it back to the beginning. You uh, were skydiving since high school, if, if I got that correctly. What was your first exposure to base jumping like? Uh, my first exposure to base jumping uh, was probably about uh, 15. And my mom was dating a gentleman that was friends with the Harrison brothers. The Harrison brothers are, I don't know, base single digits, possibly. I don't know exactly where their base numbers are. Rick and Randy Harrison. Um, and so my mom went out ground crewing um, uh, with her boyfriend because they needed someone to drive a car because they were going to jump a big antenna. So I remember uh, hearing about base jumping then. That's before I'm skydiving. Um, my brother started skydiving before I did. He's my older brother. Uh, so he started at Texas A&M College. They had a nice little club there. And his dad was a skydiver back in the 60s. So it's definitely been something that just has been in the back of my mind um, through definitely different uh, channels. Uh, and then my senior year in high school, my brother, you know, I'd already kind of told him, I, I, I want to do this. I want to do this. And it's like, okay, well, let's go ask mom. She'll have to sign the waiver for you. I'm like, okay. And yeah, lo and behold, um, you know, I got, uh, with kind of the guidance of my older brother, uh, convinced my mom that it, it was okay to let me go make my first skydive. And, um, yeah. And it just kind of, you know, evolved from there. I, I started just enjoying the equipment, even though, you know, at the time, my first five or so jumps were on round parachutes. Uh, I was just uh, immediately turned on by, you know, this these, this nylon and these lines, and it was just um, kind of evolved from there. Uh, yeah, can you take but, us back through a little bit of that old equipment? You know, what was it like? Uh, th what was the experience of base jumping like before manufactured equipment? Can you give us kind of a picture of that bygone era? Yeah. Yeah, so basically my... Um, my brother had one base jump off of a tower back in Texas. Uh, kind of fast forward a couple years, we're both skydiving at Lake Elsinore in the uh, uh, late 80s, uh, about 86, 87. Uh, there's a group of guys uh, after, you know, jumping, they go, hey, we're going to you know, go head down and jump this antenna. I'm like, huh? uh, I think we probably heard that a couple of weekends in a row, and then you know, pretty soon my brother and I start kind of asking questions. So, uh, what, what, what's this base jumping you guys can go do? Yeah, yeah, we're going to go do it. I'm going to go with us. Sure. So we just, you know, threw our skydiving rigs out on the on the grass. And uh, he's like, okay, take the bag off. Take the pilot chute off. Okay, we got to tie that slider down. All right, take your control lines. Take them outside the guide rings and take them outside the slider. All right, now let's pack it all back up in the bag. And basically just converted, you know, I had a racer at the time in a Nimbus 9 cell, and we converted it so that he, you know, he could hold the bag. 
Uh, he could tie the pilot chute, bridle and pilot chute that were still there, tie it off to the object. He'd hold the bag and he'd debag us uh, off a tower. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was my first base jump off of a, a local AM tower of all types of towers to jump. Uh, but it was just with my skydiving gear and following, uh, actually, Mark Hewitt took me on my first and was kind of my, my early mentor for several jumps. And then there were a few other people along the way in those early days, uh, Richie Stein and, and uh, yeah, Lane Kent. And so there's a lot of different influences uh, back then. But, uh, yeah, it was just using our skydiving gear and we'd convert it to from jumping all day and then have to, next morning go back to the drop zone and have to... <laughs> You know, change everything back over to get it ready for skydiving. Huh. So uh, you'd say it's it was a commonality back in the day for everyone to know their base jumping equipment pretty intimately. It's it's kind of strange that nowadays, you know, your first base jump is usually on a parachute that you are completely unfamiliar with, unless you live in a place like Southern California where you can walk into Apex Base and. You know, back in the day, you guys were just like, here, I take our extra rig and go skydive this before you take it out to the bridge. But it is kind of interesting to look back at that era and say, like, well, you guys were like kind of masters of that parachute before you even approached base jumping. Uh, yeah, because, you know, back in that time, uh, seven cells were still you know regularly used and, uh, you know, you'd get off of a, or open from a, you know, RW load and, you know, find your buddy and go do a quick two stack, you know, so it was a lot more familiarity to the, to the, to the canopy, the gear, uh, but it wasn't a, it wasn't the far cry away from now what we're using for base jumping, just a low aspect ratio, seven cell, um, uh, so yeah, you, you'd, you'd shoot accuracy kind of on every jump, um, and, and that type of stuff. Uh, so yeah, you were pretty familiar with the canopy before you went out and base jumped it. So can you give us a little bit of an insight into your mindset back in the day? Uh, what motivated you initially to, uh, pursue base jumping? I know that you, you said you were initially attracted to it because, um, your brother was doing it and some people around you, uh, but after those first jumps, what kept you motivated to progress? Yeah, a lot of different, uh, you know, motivations. Uh, I, I liked the purity of it. Uh, you had to work for your own altitude, you know, climbing a, a tower. I just remember that first time, you know, climbing this tower. It's just like, this is, you know, this is cool. You know, watching the, the city lights slowly move away, and all of a sudden now you can see further and further. Uh, so the, that, that part of the, just the purity of it, um, the sneaking around kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of fun. Um, I don't know if it was a main driver, but, uh, you know, yeah, it's, you know, go and find a building downtown and, and, you know, there was, it was, it, you know, there's definitely uh, some fun, uh, in that don't partake in, encourage that much, uh, as much anymore. I don't think it's as necessary, uh, you can really participate now, uh, you know, in, in, in different ways and make legal building jumps. And um, but that's another topic. Um, yeah. So just, uh, uh, you know, being able to hang with my brother, uh, he and I made a lot of those early base jumps together. So, you know, we we were working as carpenters or riggers and, and stuff, uh, you know, during the week. And then you know, on the weekends, we'd take off to the drop zone or take off to, you know, Arizona several times and stuff like that. Just uh, uh, so it was there was just a lot of fun in the activity, you know, camping and, and, and whatnot that just was, you know, had its own, you know, lure. Not, you know, not only just hiking around in these beautiful areas, but getting to jump. Uh, it was just really a lot of fun. Do you have any favorite objects that you've opened? Uh, that I've opened? Um yeah, the only thing I I, I don't know if I open I don't open a lot. I remember uh, uh, downtown San Diego opening a building. It was that was kind of fun. It was uh, at 19 floors. It went up to about 30 some floors, and we started jumping in it when it was at 19. And um, I happened to be the first one off that. Uh, I've got a couple in Moab, uh, little cliffs back in the day, and and whatnot. Um, so yeah, there's there's some good ones in there. Nice. So uh, flashing forward a little bit, um, how did your motivation change over the years and then start to include parachute rigging and manufacturing? Yeah, so, um, you know, the rigging 
portion uh, really started probably before I was skydiving. Uh, and definitely as soon as I did, I just was fascinated by the gear. I wanted to learn how to pack uh, very early. Um, you know, in the first jump, it was, it was just, you know, I, I was fascinated with the gear. Uh, my brother had a rig kind of before I did. He had already um, been making several hundred jumps. He'd bring it in, and it was just like, this is so cool. Show me how this works, you know. Um, so I've ha always had a fascination with it. Uh, I've always liked building stuff. Um, you know, in high school, I was uh, already working a, a lot as a carpenter. Uh, and, uh, could, you know, just I remember seeing my brother uh building stuff for his truck, um, uh, like redoing the, 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 the headliner and stuff. So I had my mom's sewing machine, he's cutting fabric. So just being creative that way was, you know, was, was around. I remember helping him with it going, Oh, this is pretty cool. Yeah. And, and then when it's done and you're you know, riding around in his truck and, and you're, you know, it's just, it, it, there was that accomplishment. So as soon as I started getting into skydiving, I, I had some of these practical things. So I, I definitely was interested in the early, I became a senior rigger, uh, you know, uh, pretty early. I probably had 150-ish skydives is around the same time I started base jumping. Um, and it just was, it just, it was logic, you know, it was like, okay, I, I, I like this stuff. What, you know, I I, I want to learn more. So I trained under uh, Frank Mott and got my senior rigger ticket. And uh, he was, you know, very open to letting us uh, sit down and sew in his, his shop. And so we had access to sewing machines. And that's when we started building, um, you know, base equipment. So one of the first things we built were tail pockets. Um, my mentor had a tail pocket. And I was like, hey, where'd you get that? And he's like, oh, I don't know. Uh, Bill made it for me. Well, where's Bill? Well, I don't know. I think he's dead now. It's like, oh, that doesn't help, you know? So, you know, go over with the tape, go over with the tape measure and measure it and go back to the, you know, uh, take some notes and uh, little drawings and whatnot. And we go back into Frank's uh, uh, loft and, and try to build our own and, and, and put it on our, our canopy and start using it. And then our buddies would say, Hey, where'd you go to the tail pocket? Oh, we built one. Oh, build me one. Okay. You know, and it's really just how it started. Uh, just, uh, you know, seeing, you know, customized, you know, gear that, um, that our friends were using and it was working well, you know, our first, uh, single parachute Velcro closed rig that I used was built by my buddy on his mom's home sewing machine. <laughs> The deal was, no is way. you got to buy a, yeah, so awesome. buy a skydiving rig, buy a skydiving rig, strip all the container off, give him the harness and the back pad, okay? He'll take it to his mom's sewing machine, and he's going to build four flaps with some Velcro, and he'd give it back to you. So it, you know, it was just this converted mess, uh, um, but it worked, and uh, it was kind of, you know, it's where, you know, that's where I started you know, realizing, huh, that's all it is. I can do that, you know. Um, so oh for a while, God. we just converted. Yeah, we just converted, used uh, existing skydiving rigs with, you know, stripped off all the container stuff, left the back pad, left the harness. We'd add a container to it. We probably only did a couple of those, a handful of them. And, you know, I remember Frank looking at it and go, well, why don't we just build the harness? I'm like, oh, you can do that? He goes, uh, yeah, we can do that. And I'm like, Okay. Wait, so, hang on a second. Yeah. What did what did uh, what did the moms think about y'all using their sewing machines to create parachutes? I mean, geez, <laughs> dude, my mom gets I out of sorts. I, you know, if I uh, if I'm doing even the least dangerous thing, let alone like using her <laughs> her sewing machine to make experimental base jumping yeah. equipment. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if she uh, ever knew, honestly. So I, I never ended up using my mom's stuff. So this was my buddy using his mom's sewing machine. But she had to know that uh, someone was using it because he was sewing through some really thick stuff. That it just was <laughs> atrociously sewn because the machine just couldn't handle it. And so I can't imagine if she came back in and tried to sew something, uh, some garment, and, and that it, the machine was even working anymore. But, yeah, it's, um, yeah, just what you kind of did at the time can you expand on this picture a little bit for us how were there any commercial base jumping manufacturers at this point uh n not to my knowledge so no i don't believe there was and then there was kind of one exception uh there was uh, a, a rigger uh, by the name of hank asudo uh, i forget the, the company para 
can't remember the name of the company right now, but he was a local Paris rigger manufacturer, had a, a harness container system, had round reserves. Um, and then he also built this oversized drogue parachutes. And if I remember correctly, they were for decelerating bombs that had been dropped from airplanes, giving the plane enough time to get away before it impacted. So these things are 52 inches in diameter, and they were and, and they were built like a tank. Um, they were heavy and huge. So that was some of our first big pilot shoots. Uh, you know, there had been a few fatalities and, and, and problems with small pa- pilot shoots, so everyone was going, oh, you know, we probably should have a bigger one. And so that was th- like the first pilot shoot that we could just go buy. So he wasn't really marketing them, and what they weren't designed for it, but he was like, sure, you need that. Here it is. And Decelerating so we were able to buy his... Missiles. Yeah, yeah. It was weird. You, 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 it literally, you'd, you know, two seconds or so, you'd throw it out there and it'd stay in free fall with you for a little bit. And you're like, and then you'd finally get going faster. Than like, okay. So even though it was big, man, it was, it was 52 inches, which was just a monster, still is, but it was heavy. And, um, but it worked. It, it you know, get the, between the Velcro rigs and big pilot shoots, it started, you know, we started gathering data that, okay, these things are working. You know, what about how many people? Systems. Sorry, what about how many people were actually practicing? Like, how many people were base jumping at the time? Like, did you you were in Southern California at the time? You had friends right. of friends who were jumping. Did you know about anybody else? Like, even in Northern California or outside of the United States? Yeah, it, it was it was small, but it was it was spread out. So Bridge Day was already still you know had kind of already started. Um, I hadn't been out there yet. I I think I made my first journey to Bridge Day in like 87. So there'd already been a couple years uh, of that. Um, uh, you know, the whole thing with uh, with Carl had already happened. He would or- he was already gone. Um, so there definitely was some activity, Southern California activity, Florida activity. Uh, I know, you know, like in, in Pennsylvania and stuff, uh, there was some activity. A lot of it revolved around... Uh, you know, the New River Gorge Bridge, that was like the only event, Bridge Day was really the only event where you could kind of go and meet other people that were like-minded. Um, so there was a, a just kind of a sprinkling. Uh, numbers, I, I, you know, I just don't know. It'd be such yeah. a guess, but it, it, it certainly uh, had had its uh, areas of activity. Um, uh, you know, the base numbers, you know, are, you know were still in, you know, double digits and stuff there just was it's a not small like you were jumping on activities. instagram and, and sharing your jumps and <laughs> no yeah yeah definitely not yeah there was there was none of that you know it, it was great when the facts finally came around and we could kind of communicate on a different level and and whatnot but yeah in those early days uh it was you know it was just word of mouth um and uh at the time, Gene had a little booklet that was put together that kind of that kind of helped. I remember uh, my brother getting some help from uh, uh, you know um, uh, Phil Smith, who was base number one, and you know he'd, he'd talked to him on the phone. Okay, when you're climbing a tower, you want to you know make sure nothing opens up, so put some tape here and there. And now when you get when you get to the top, you'll have to take all that tape off and you know and stuff like that. So it was definitely. Uh, using skydiving gear and, and trying to make it work at the time. When did you make the transition to making a purpose-built base jumping system? And what was that initial system? Um, so it all started with uh, harness containers. At that time, we were able to, you know, find parachutes that, that you know, worked. They were skydiving canopies. You know, they weren't vented, anything like that. They didn't have tail pockets, so we always did that mod. So some of the first dedicated stuff was harness containers, Velcro closed. Uh, so, you know, really simple. You know, they didn't, uh, most of the time we were using them, we were going handheld, so we didn't even have a BOC on them. We had two rubber bands in the back that you just kind of stow the pilot chute in. Um, yeah, so just, you know, really simple skydiving converted canopies and, but a dedicated harness container system. Uh, we didn't start building canopies until dedicated base canopies until kind of mid 1990s. I think it was like 1994 is when we kind of realized that, uh, that we, 
needed them and we had something to offer. Skydiving was now going a different direction, so there weren't as many of the skydiving canopies available. And just to um, as, get a little know, history in here, that was before Apex existed. That was a different company that you ran, right? Yeah, exactly. So it kind of it, it started in the late 80s with TNT Rigging. That was my brother and I. And then uh, I partnered up with uh, Ann Helliwell uh, in uh, the 90s, and we started Basic Research. Uh, and then about 2004, um, uh, partnered up with uh, Jimmy and Marta of Vertigo, and that became Apex Base. So, yeah, there's been definitely different um, you know, iterations uh, throughout the years, uh, but that's kind of the, the nutshell. And so it, just as a quick aside, that does make Apex and it's like uh, companies that, you know, eventually merged uh, the longest running base manufacturer, right? Like you guys have been manufacturing base equipment as a, as a team for longer than any any other standing company i i th- i think that would be a fair statement um yeah so through the iterations um it, it's it's been there for for quite a while yeah and and quite a few innovations along the way which we kind of want to get into a little bit you know as you were talking about that first base system uh maybe you can bring us along with some of the innovations that allowed you know you to do <laughs> thousands of jumps uh, over you know the next couple decades, uh, re- you know sustainably and repeatedly. Yeah, so uh, it was uh, basically starting with, uh, like I said, the Velcro closed rigs, uh, then uh, dedicated canopies uh, that were you know, really designed from the ground up for base jumping. Uh, still did not have uh, vents at this time, uh, but uh, you know we we're starting to do. Uh, uh, reinforcement and stuff. Uh, some a lot of the early skydiving canopies didn't have what is kind of normal reinforcement now, like spanwise reinforcement. We knew that if with a par- single parachute system, if we had a problem, we'd want a little bit more of a some structural integrity, a little you know something under the skin, uh, so it would maintain its shape better if you did blow a panel or something. Uh, and then uh, yeah, uh, made the transition from Velcro closed rigs to pin closed rigs, um, which is you know very similar to the dual pin rigs that we use today. Some different you know closing flaps. Uh, continued to try to improve. Uh, yeah, I hear some of the initial designs were were single pin, right? And then uh, the industry kind of went mm-hmm. away from single pin, and uh, I, that's always been kind of a question that people bring up when they get into it is like, why are there two pins? Why not with just one? And uh, I usually retort with, well, you know, there was a single pin rig before him. Maybe you can bring us up to speed on that. Uh, yeah, so as a you know, as a designer and, and a, a rig builder, it's like, well, can't we do it with one pin? And the answer is yes. You can build uh, a, a good, a good safe rig with one pin. The downside, it's just really hard to pack. So when you are packing your base rig, uh, it's it's a little, you know, we know it's much longer. And so we like those two side flap pieces of plastic to say parallel, right? So but with two pins, it's super easy. They're always going to be parallel. With a single pin, you put that grommet in the middle and the pin in the middle, and if you pack a little heavy at the bottom, your flaps do that. If you pack a little heavy at the top, your flaps do that. It really puts a lot of uh, emphasis on the packer. you got to make everything just, and that's just not practical. So will it work? Yeah, but it, it's, it's a tough rig to make look nice. With two pins, boom, 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 it's done. And, you know, it does help uh, reduce the pin tension a little bit. Uh, We didn't see any huge difference in that, but, you know, spreading that out over two pins does reduce the tension a little bit. Um, And it's just so much easier to pack and have a a nice-looking container when you're all done. So we went from Velcro to single pin to double pin. Are there any uh, advantages to Velcro anymore? Like, is there any application where Velcro is actually more optimal or is the two pin system just the standard, the gold standard? And, and just to be clear, the the, the progress of uh, that transition, we didn't actually go to the single pin first. So most of the very early pin closed base rigs were dual pin because they were easier to build and, and pack. And then once we were doing, you're like, well, can't we do it with one? And so we did. And we had a, a, a rig out there called the Prism. 
And, and again, it, it, it worked, but we went back to two pin, or we naturally never stopped doing the two pin. We had a, a dual pin first, went to a single pin, continued to manufacture both of them, and then just kind of discontinued the, the single pin. So then back to your question, um, I, I see very little benefit to the Velcro. Um, I don't see a huge downside if they're used in the environment that they're kind of designed for, which is just the low air speed. Um, uh, you know, but there's, you know, very, very little, I think, benefit uh, in them. They're, they are a simpler system in some regards to uh, see if, uh, to see that they're done properly. That flap that's on the outside comes completely off. So misrouting bridle is a little bit more difficult uh, where some people have misrouted a pin closed rig and it's it's been problematic. Um, uh, but yeah, they you know they wear the Velcro wears out. They're not really good for high air speed. Uh, they're a little more finicky to pack. Um, you can't pack them as tight, you know. Uh, so they really don't work well for high air speed. Um, even even though they've been used, I, I know that you know the, I, when I first went to Angel Falls, I was jumping a Velcro closed rig, and everyone was just like, "What are you doing?" You know, so <laughs> there they, no one had showed up. No one no one had showed up with a single parachute system there before, and all of a sudden, I'm, like, well, I'm 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 okay with it. Are you okay? And they let me jump it, but yeah, I had like gaffer's tape over the leading edge so I wouldn't lose my my uh, flap and while I was tracking away and stuff. So they you know they they can work, but the the the, the curve pen just is such a good uh, system. Uh, stainless steel curve pens against stainless steel uh, grommets uh, and the right closing material is super consistent. So even the guys that are doing the really low stuff now would prefer typically to go with a pen closed rig because it, it's, it's easier to get the container open. A um, uh, little less force is needed, and, uh, and that's a good thing. I was going to say... Uh, the only other thing I can think of now is just how amazing that half a second notification of the tearing of the Velcro, how good that feels when you're going to do something low. So it sounds like, yeah, if, if you've been in that environment, yeah, the, the, the sound of the Velcro tearing is so reassuring. You've tossed your pilot chute and then you hear, it, you're like, all right, yeah, here it comes. Something's all happened. Right. <laughs> yeah, you do miss that. Yeah, no doubt. So uh, if we can, let's get into some of the design innovations over the years, some of the stuff that y'all came up with that are now pretty much standard on every single base canopy on the market. Um, two of them that I'd like to jump into are VTech and, and the um, tailgate. And maybe you can walk us through when y'all came up with that and what the innovation process was like. Um, okay, sure. Uh, we'll start with the, the tailgate. Um, so obviously we knew lineovers can happen. They they weren't happening a lot, but occasionally you'd, you know someone would report or you'd see or you'd get uh, a lineover malfunction. This is typically no slider stuff. So slider up, uh, we dabbled in that a little bit in the in that day, but most of what we were doing was no slider stuff. Southern California, you know Arizona, Nevada, or excuse me, Arizona, Utah. Um, uh, the bridges that we were playing on and uh, objects we had available, just about all of it was no slider. Uh, it was really interesting that, uh, you know, videoing uh, some, um, or uh, you know, we'd go out to make balloon jumps or go out and make uh, some base jumps on brand new canopies and we'd come back and we'd, we'd see damage. We're like, what the heck is this? Look at this. And we'd get damage back in the tail section uh, around where the... Uh, upper control lines connect and uh, back on those back corners or the stabilizer. It's like, you know, we're all packing really good. This thing's brand new. Well, you know, what's going on? Um, and so we, we could see it, but we we could see the aftermath, but we didn't know what was happening at the time. It wasn't a, a line over. Uh, Martin Tilly was uh, with us at that time, working with us, and he had a canopy that had a black top surface and a gray bottom surface and one of the times we went back and we're reviewing video and it was like oh wait a minute back that up what was that look at that we're looking at your black surface but all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of gray w what's going on and basically what we were getting is partial line overs that would clear themselves we started referring to them as tail inversions but that that tail back there would flip over and then as it would 
write itself, the, it would burn. And it was like, okay, there's a lot going on in there that we don't even know is happening during these openings. And so it was really at that time that we, we realized, okay, so we gotta, we gotta work on c controlling these control lines a, a bit more. Um, some people started playing with uh, the, the masking tape. I, I don't carry masking tape in my riggers kit, so it, it seemed a little bit of a stretch. Um, I remember a friend having Annie had a, a, a tower strike, and she thought she had a line over, and uh, Marty and I just happened to be up in, in uh, Oregon jumping. And I just remember sitting there going, well, we just need something that can hold on to them, but we just need it to open up when it's time. And I just remember doing this with my fingers, just put, you know, touching my two fingers together. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, I can make a piece of that out of Dacron, and we'll just close it off with a rubber band. Um, we were also playing with uh, like a single stow of line. You can kind of do it, but the single stow of lines, uh, line bites, as you could call them, tend to come out a little less evenly. The pieces that are touching the rubber band tend to come out la later. The stuff inside the rubber band tends to come out a little bit easier. It's not, it doesn't have quite the same resistance on it. So uh, we knew a, a, a stow could kind of work, but this, this device that was closed and, and then it was open and everything was free to leave at the same time, um, yeah, it was just, so we started building some and, and all of us internally at, at our shop and our buddies and stuff that, that were jumping, most of them were like, oh, I'll, I'll take one of those. And so we, we sat on that one or we used that one internally probably close to a year um, and, uh, and, you know, sharing it with, you know, what, whoever we were jumping with. And yeah, so over the years, it's, uh, you know, be kind of become, you know, pretty commonplace. Uh, I think it's doing a great job. I mean, it's not perfect. Um, but, uh, it definitely, I think has reduced the incidence of line overs and the incidence of tail inversions, which is, you know, what was creating a quite a bit of damage. And obviously the potential for a malfunction was, was there. So is your opinion on the other uh, methods of tailgating, can they be summed up by what you had said earlier? Like, I just don't have that in my kit. I mean, I, I, I think they were all trying to do the same thing. So, you know, kudos to that. Um, uh, but again, I didn't have tape uh, in my kit. You know, I, I, I didn't necessarily like uh, uh, masking tape. It really changes as it gets older. Um, you know, I've, I've been a carpenter. I paint, and you, you pick up an old roll, and it just doesn't work. You, and it just wasn't consistent. So, in my brain, it was like, well, what, what are we already really used to? Rubber bands. You know, we're used to those. We've been using them for years, and they seem to, to lend themselves pretty well to our sport and they're already in our kit and, you know, building one of these little things that we can really control. So I, you know, I didn't have a necessarily a problem with the, with the, the tape. I personally have never used it. Um, you know, I think you can really get some uh, inconsistency because of the brand and how old it is, how many wraps you take. And so I think there's just a lot more room for not really doing it like your buddy who's having really good experience with it, you could use a different brand or a different thick end. And I guess there could be the same thing for, for rubber bands. Uh, but, um, yeah, it was just something that, that, you know, we developed and it seemed like, it, uh, you know, the way to go. And we started sharing it and it was, you know, fairly well received. Um, you know, nothing's perfect. Like I mentioned, uh, I remember going to Moab one time and, uh, you know, I was like, oh, it's the trash gate. And I was like, oh, the trash gate? The tr you guys are you guys are littering rubber bands all over the place. I'm like, oh, okay, that's okay. So that's when we started Lark's heading the rubber band onto the tailgate Wonderful. so that they wouldn't blow off every time. You know, he still does them occasionally. Yeah, you know, and that's really how that evolved. So in the beginning, yeah, we just had it free wrapped. And yes, we would lose them occasionally. Sometimes one slide, one side of the tailgate slides out and the rubber band stays. But most of the time you lose your rubber band. So, okay. And so we larks headed it on so we wouldn't lose it as often. So, yeah. Well, okay, let's, uh, let's get into some other technology. The um, bottom skin vents. Uh, can you give us some insights into how y'all figured that one out and um, how it's been uh, iterated on over the years? Yeah, um, you know, so it, there were several different uh, uh, calls. So we had been manufacturing canopies, base specific canopies, probably for six years or so. And every once in a while you would get the phone call, man, I, I made this jump last night and 
I, you know, I reached up and grabbed my risers and it just wouldn't turn. It would, you know, it just would, it would, it wouldn't do anything I wanted to do. What's, you know, and I was like, okay, you know, and you get a few of those co- phone calls and then you start going, ah, so let me guess you were jumping uh, a tower. Yeah. And you were on the downwind side. Oh, of course. All right. So basically, and then I bet, you know, the winds were you know, moving. Oh, yeah, yeah. It made it safer. Okay. So we, you know, it wasn't long before you realized that, you know, you got to fly the wind speed to get ram. Uh, and then after that, you'll finally get ram air. So if you have any type of tailwind, so if you're on a bridge or a tower where it was happening the most, and you had a tailwind and you wanted to get a little correction, you, you didn't have a pressurized wing. You had fabric, but you were not pressurized. And you could watch it. You could see it from, you know, if you're watching your buddy, you could just tell it just stayed this jellyfish above your head until you got to the speed of the wind. And then you finally got faster and you finally get this ram air and you'd actually get pressurization. Ah, now you've got a wing you can fly. But it could take, depending on the wind and direction, it could take a while. It would still happen if the wind was, uh, you know, coming across the canopy rather than straight into the nose. If you ever cross wind, um, uh, one of the, you know, I had a friend that was jumping a tower uh, down here and got off the tower, opened, tried to do a riser turn and it wouldn't do it. So he's like, oh, shit, you know, and he's getting after it harder and harder, trying to get it to turn. And ends up impacting the, the ground without having anything really inflated, but just continuing to try to steer away. And bust up his foot and everything. was. He was like, but, you know, he goes, I've got a lot of jumps on that canopy, and it just has never done that before. And so it was, this, you know, it was seeing these incidents happen over and over. It's like, we need something, that some way to get this canopy pressurized faster, you know, and... We started looking at uh, cutting the bottom surface a little differently. Um, I remember some old parachutist magazines that showed these great big holes in the bottom of the canopy. Uh, I think it was the accuracy guys. I don't know exactly what the the reasoning behind it was. I, I tried to do a little research, but I think it was mostly for uh, for openings. Um, and so, yeah, so we started putting uh, vents on the bottom. Um, and Unfortunately, we had some some friends that saw it. Uh, Dwayne was was one of the early guys. He was living uh, um, in the states by this time, and you're talking Dwayne Weston, Dane, Dwayne Weston, and he was into the low stuff. And so, as soon as he saw, we were throwing, basically started throwing dummies off of Rubido. We had a, a di- drop test dummy. We <laughs> built these canopies. It had vents, and we started throwing it off of Rubido. And lo and behold, just you, know, you could just see it. It was just pressurized every single time you're like whoa that's really nice and so some people started seeing that and they started kind of putting pressure on us to 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 release it man we weren't done with the valve the valve took us a while to find a valve that we liked that wouldn't impede you know uh, inlet um you know the inflow wouldn't impede the inflow but would you know close off consistently and and really prevent air from exiting so there were a few canopies we put out uh, with without uh, any covers, uh, which was a mistake. In, in hindsight, um, we should have just held out a little longer, but we were just getting pressure from, you know, friends going, "You gotta, guys, gotta release this. This is this is huge. Look at you know," and it was. Uh, you could see the opening was so much better, and in those early days without the vents, it really took away from the landing performance. You just lost pressure. And it, you know, obviously not good. So it took a while to come up with a uh, a valve that we liked, a a cover that we liked, and uh, and just have really you know it's it's changed a lot of the sport. One of the things I wasn't as thrilled about uh, uh, is it brought the bottom end down. You know, now we were getting people that were you know regularly free falling sub 200 feet, which you just wouldn't do. You know, and it's like, oh, come on, guys, really? <laughs> Does that really have to, have to do? It's not what, you know, so it wasn't necessarily the unintended consequences. Um, and, um, yeah, it just, uh, it, it was, it was, it was big because you could really now uh, get the, the wing pressurized just from the relative wind of our free falling body. So as soon as you get to line stretch, yep, you get that canopy expansion. And right after that, you're pressurized. So now as soon as it moves forward, you've got control. You can make a turn. 
you know, regardless if you had any RAM error or not, you know, and it was way less sensitive to, um, the, you know, your, your, the winds that you're opening. And if it's a crosswind or tailwind, it just didn't have the same effect. You actually had a wing ready to go. Uh, as soon as it moved forward, it was already pressurized, so it was ready to create lift. Then we found the, you know, the benefit also if you ever did have a, a strike against a building or a, a cliff where your nose was closed off and you're sliding down, the canopy before would get really small because now there's no pressure. At least now the vents would open back up and keep some pressure inside, which keeps the wing a little bit bigger and just reduces your you know, descent rate. And as soon as you get it turned away, it's already pressurized. So again, you can fly it a much sooner uh, than a, a non-vented canopy. So, I'm curious, Todd, on a, a personal note, you were going through a lot of technological innovation and with that uh, can, but I assume must have been some moments that tested your resolve. Did you, uh, were there moments where you questioned yourself or there was moments of self-doubt I can assume that there were some accidents and, and uh, worse. Yeah, um, you know, uh, actually, one of them that that, um, that that comes to mind is is with the tailgate. So, like I said, we had kind of sat on that one uh, and just were using it in house for for uh, in our in our you know our our close group of you know ten jumpers or so and 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 whatnot. And then uh, a friend of ours, a customer of ours, uh, Gary Dawson, had a, a line over it that put him into a cliff, and, and he ended up dying. And it was kind of at that time we were like, okay, we're trying to be conservative and safe by not being too fast to release something. And it, it was an eye-opener that at some point, if, if we think this is a step in the right direction, we've got we've to let people know we honestly felt we had something that could have helped prevent that. So that one sticks with me. I think it's a reverse of possibly what you thought, uh, but that's the one that, that sticks with me. I, I, I'm not aware of, of, of anything that really was um, where you know the innovation was hurting. Like I said, I, I wasn't excited about how, uh, you know, vented canopies really did allow people to to jump lower it's like ah i know yeah you're right it's pressurized much sooner and yeah i can see why you would you know the, the, especially you know there's a group of guys I probably all know some of them that just really enjoy the bottom end you know uh, ralph greenaway you know he was in my shop all the time going come on what can you do you know there's something you can do what you know what would you do if if i told you i wanted to free fall you know 150 feet, uh, you know, and it, it was a lot of conversation uh, to to finally say, okay, you know, this is custom built for you because you've been a pest in my ear for a year, and I you're serious and you're you are already doing this, and so what can we do? Okay, so we we were able to you know custom build a canopy, you know, and change you know big bigger vents, uh, more of them, short the line kit a little bit. Uh, put a ZP top on it so any air getting in ain't getting out. Um, you know, so we did a few of these things, and yeah, and he started, you know, continued to, you know, explore the bottom end that, you know, I, I, again, I didn't, I, I, I certainly had never encouraged that, um, and we never actually even marketed that canopy. Again, a few people go, hey, I saw that canopy you guys built for Ralph. I want one. I'm like, okay. You know, who are you? you know, how many jumps do you have? You know, and and make them jump through the hoops and and spend the time convincing me generally that you know that, that you know that they were gonna treat it with a lot of respect because it, it's not it's not perfect, it's not foolproof. Let's um, talk about that for a second because I remember being one of those pests in your ear too. Uh, coming in, like trying to design the new canopy that I wanted. And at the time, y'all were coming out with uh, ultralight fabric. And one of my mm -hmm. goals was to be able to free fall Rubido, that low cliff that you were talking about earlier is your test yep. jump. And so like I, I had you make me an, you know, an ultralight flick with five vents and some of the other bells and whistles that you were talking about, but not all of them. And uh, I guess the question is what responsibility 
do you think uh, is on the manufacturer versus, you know, the jumper who's about to take your equipment into territory that you don't really know that even is possible? You know, like I was like wanting to get that canopy so that I could push into territory that was theoretical. Right. And that's, you know, that's, that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, and it's, uh, it, you know, it, that's when it becomes a relationship between myself and who wants to buy it. Uh, when we start getting into those really custom pieces, uh, sure, there's a you know part of my brain that that uh, that wants to help. Yeah, that sounds cool. Let's work on that. But I have to be careful that I'm not encouraging just really bad behavior. So you know, I I make sure they you know sought me out. You came and sought me out. You came into my shop and and. I probably didn't say, okay, I'll build you one tomorrow. I was like, nah, well, okay, sounds fun, but, you know, and I probably, you come back and, you know, six months later, a year later, we're still having the same conversation. You're still, you know, oftentimes I would, I would encourage, you know, the, the person who was interested, well, what would you do? What do you think we could do? And, well, can we make them bigger? Yeah, we can. So I, I, I liked to involve them in the process rather than just saying, hey, I've got this because, you know, occasionally they, they'd come up with, an idea I hadn't thought. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. And then we could expand on it. So again, I, I, I needed to make sure, or at least I felt the best way to go about it was making sure that they're already kind of uh, in, a, in a position to contribute rather than just following. I, I didn't want to have anyone following me or following my gear into those realms. But if they were interested in it, that seemed logical. Okay, yeah, I can I can see where you might want to do that, um, and so that's how I treated it most of the time. Uh, and you know, you, you must have you know kind of stuck around long enough and, and 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 shared with me that you know yeah you're thinking, you're a thinker, and that's what we need because this isn't this isn't just here do this X Y Z it'll work. No, you need to kind of think about a whole bunch of other stuff, and then apply what you know, these tools that we've built, but, you know, there's weather and there's physical, uh, you know, limitations and, you know, exit position and where do you put the pilot chute and, well, you know, just a whole bunch of things that just having this, you know, this custom built parachute, you know, could just get you in a lot of trouble if you're not thinking about all the other stuff. So, you know, I've always tried to make sure that they were already thinking about the other stuff first. And then if I could lend a hand to customize something that would help them, you know, achieve a different goal. Uh, I, I was willing to do that. I'm curious. We were talking about lightweight fabric. It kind of got my, uh, me thinking, were there certain elements uh, that the activity and the industry or directions the industry was headed that really gave you pause and like thinking, hey, maybe this isn't the way we should be going? Not so much in uh, equipment uh, that I can think of immediately. I remember just one of them, uh, you know, when everyone started doing aerials off of buildings, you know, I'm going to do a double backflip, you know, and it, most of that influence at the time was coming from Jeb. And I'm like, what are you doing? Can't you just be happy, just flat and stable, open a parachute, land, and be comfortable with that? No, I can't, you know, I have to do this double back flip. And then so that I just didn't get. That was, you know, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not as young as those guys. I, and I, I definitely have a different, you know, take on it. So definitely in some of those regards, um, uh, equipment regards, I, 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 nothing's coming to mind uh, right off uh, the bat. If I think of something, I'll, I'll, I'll let well, you know. But. We were talking with, uh, we spoke with Chris McNamara and, uh, you know, he was getting some ultralight gear made for him and Dean or both him and Dean were asking for this so that they could climb with it and, and hike with it and everything like that. And, and I think that there was, uh, well, I know that there was some hard lessons and some growing pains with, in the ultralight uh, arena and uh, I so guess each, it, please go ahead. Yeah, it's so not really a question, but it's a, a thought point. Yeah. So with the ultralight fabric, um, to my recollection, the first people who were really honestly playing with that was a tear, and so they started uh, uh, using ultralight fabric. Pretty, uh, you know, they were some of the earliest ones. I sorry, I don't really have a date for it. Um, 
collectively, we kind of discussed it. We said, you know, let's just sit on the sideline for a little bit. Um, it was definitely not something that everyone was like, woohoo, that's going to be great. But, you know, there's enough people that said, now this would is, this is be really handy. Um, we decided to kind of let's take a step back. Let's not hop on this right away and, um, and, and see where it goes. It probably was a year or so later. I, I ran into Stane from Atera uh, in Norway and, uh, it was just really nice. Uh, he and I've always had a nice relationship and we just started talking. He said, so how's that, you know, that light fabric? He goes, oh, it's, it's great. He goes, we really love it. And, um, and actually shared the manufacturer of the fabric with us. Uh, and so we, uh, you know, started to inquire about the fabric and, you know, I'm sure he, they knew it, but I didn't know it in this time that it was meeting the, the specification for strength, uh, that you would find from, you know, like standard F-111 type fabric. And that was, but it was, you know, like 20% less bulky. Uh, so it was, you know, it was, it was noticeable, uh, you know, a year or so later, uh, some of that got out, uh, and uh, the 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 desire to have that type of fabric. Um, I remember going to one PIA meeting or a, a symposium, and there was other ultralight fabric, but the one thing that they continue couldn't match is the strength. They could get the porosity, they could get the lower bulk, but no one that I was aware of that I was able to find could get the same strength that you could get from the company's Porsche uh, out of France. So Porsche was able to get all of the stuff that we wanted, needed, porosity, strength, and lower bulk. Uh, and I think that, I think there were some experiments uh, or some uh, canopies built not from us, but from other people using other fabric. And I think that's probably where some of the, 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 the bad juju, it's not all the same fabric. Um, uh, so we started uh, after, you know, kind of talking with Stane and building in-house canopies for ourselves and, and um, taking it in for pull tests. We have a, a, a company here close to us uh, that we've worked with for years that have all that equipment. They can give us porosity testing, but they also have, you know, a tensile testing machines. So we were able to take rolls of fabric into them, get it all tested. We were finding out the same thing. This stuff is just as strong uh, and then started using it and did, you know, tests after, you know, had a hundred jumps or so. I think, Matt, you had one of those early canopies that I think you said you had like a thousand jumps on it or am I, am I remember, remember? As all, I think it was all white because that was all, all the fabric was available and it was white. Yeah. And, and it got way more jumps than we thought. Uh, I, I remember initially you're like, well, Matt, this is like kind of a new fabric on the market and you know, you're essentially going to be test jumping it. So like, as you get to like several hundred jumps, like check back in with us and bring it back in so we can look at it and um, see how it holds up. And you were telling me that like, based on where I was packing it and how I was abrading it, like it might only last for 500 jumps. And turns yeah, out it was, know. yeah, we just didn't know. And it turned out it, it actually lasted for about 1500 jumps before uh, we decided like, all right, this flare is just not great. Um, and I kind of wish I had kept, I held on to it because like <laughs> the way it wore was actually really comfortable. So like if I wanted to deploy something super low out of an aircraft right now, like that, like ultralight material after 1500 jumps is like perfect. Um, yeah. but yeah, I, I remember yeah. that canopy. Yeah. So, you know, structurally speaking, we, we've got a framework underneath the skin that, you know, can go, you know, thousands of jumps, but, uh, the performance of the fabric maintaining uh, anything close to the zero porosity just continues to fade and now air passes through the canopy so so much that the performance like you're saying the flare and uh, opening performance tend to suffer uh, it wants to snivel uh, it's the opening performance uh, but again if that's comfortable then you know it's on a skydive then you can you can get away with it but uh yeah, so we just uh, yeah we were super excited to that that we were getting these reports uh, that it was it was lasting, uh, you know it, it you know we didn't treat it any different if if everyone else is packing in a parking lot we'd throw it down and pack in the parking lot or the grass or the sand or wherever and we tried not to baby it, and it really has just been really good fabric the you know the 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 biggest downsides are cost uh, and especially since COVID availability uh, has just been really difficult. Um, um, 
you know, those are the, you know, those, oh, and the colors, uh, not a major uh, difference, but uh, you know, it's like only four colors available or you have to buy so much of a color that you might request that it just is, is a bit cost prohibitive. Well, we're talking about fabric. I know that uh, you guys did a pretty interesting test on UV uh, light on fabrics back in the day at Paris. And it's been like an ongoing debate in not only parachuting, but like any other sport that uses nylon fabric. Can you uh, give us some um, details on that test? I, I Maybe you're being too generous. Um, it was an observation. You know, we wanted to you know, just see if we could notice any you know, you know, major difference in the degradation of a fabric after it's been in the sun. So, you know, just real simple. Uh, took, I think, eight different pieces uh, of a fabric stapled it onto a piece of plywood and put it on the roof, uh, you know, in Southern California. And every, I think, month or I forget what the interval was, every month we'd go and pull a piece off. And so then after all eight pieces have been pulled off, we'd take it in and get them pull tested uh, and porosity tested. And uh, we didn't notice, uh, we didn't any, you know, so our test results, you know, not, not super conclusive, but no, we didn't notice anything radical. So not only did we leave these pieces out of ultralight fabric, we would also leave pieces of F-111. So we were trying to, you know, compare them to the fabric that we had already adopted in our industry as, it's good, you know. We can use that. So we were just going to see if if one or the other had any major degradation just with the exposure. No, it wasn't noticeable, but not that we had a huge sampling, but in our small sampling, it was uh, negligible of what we were able to find. So, we, you know, again, it gave us a little more confidence that this stuff, you know, it, again, the feel was so different. And if you felt regular fabric and you feel the ultralight fabric, you're like, this stuff just can't be as strong. It, okay, well, if it's as strong, it can't last as long. It's just, it's impossible. And so we were kind of trying to, you know, you know, we didn't know. We were definitely, you know, in it for ourselves as well. We were using these canopies, and we wanted to know if just if there was a s certain point that this stuff was just going to, you know, turn into toilet paper and just dissolve on us. And uh, so we were just, you know, so, yeah, we left it out and, you know, different samples out in the sun for different lengths of time, compared it with, you know, the, the fabric that we were already using, uh, F-111s type fabric, and just didn't have anything, you know, super noticeable uh, in our sampling. Great. So we could just leave our gear outside. <laughs> I, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> I can't believe <laughs> I can't believe how many years I've been worried about exposing my parachute to the sun, and, and in the end, it doesn't really matter. Now, 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 keep in mind, there is a degradation, but it wasn't significant over the other fabric that we have already been using. So did we notice that, that, that both the regular fabric and the ultralight fabric did get weaker as it was out in the sun? Yes, but it wasn't like, oh, but this one's de deteriorating at twice the factor of our normal fabric. So it definitely does take, you know, UV is going to eat nylon. It's just simple. Right. It does. It breaks it down. Uh, but it wasn't happening at a faster rate with this new fabric. It was happening at a rate that appeared to be really close. So we we're like, well, it's, you know, that kind of makes sense. It's still nylon. We're comparing two nylons and they're having kind of the same degradation that we can measure. But gotcha. it is definitely still weakening it. Yeah, I mean, I should preface that a little bit. I, I just remember, you know, know it alls at the drop zone saying, hey, "Get your canopy out of the sun." You know, it's like laser beams from the sun are coming at you. <laughs> and you know, like later on, I get into paragliding, and I'm going on these eight-hour flights with my paraglider, <laughs> and you know, it's fine. Uh, but yeah. but anyway, yeah. um, I, I'm wondering if we can pivot just a little bit because. Um, this is a hot button topic and it still uh -oh. remains like the boogeyman um, for me. And, and that's tension knots. I have a feeling ah. you've spent a quite a bit of time thinking about this. Uh, do you have any thoughts about it? Uh, yeah. Where are we going with this? How we can reduce their frequency and how frequent is it? Yeah. Um, and this I, is, I'm talking slider up here for everybody listening. Bingo, bingo. So obviously one of the, I think biggest uh, concerns a lot of uh, base jumpers that participate in a slider up jump have is the, the tension knots. We don't know exactly 
how it happens. I think we several people agree that it's 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 uh, likely well, maybe a couple different uh, uh, reasons. I think the most substantial is somewhere during deployment we get slack in the control lines. You know, when you're skydiving, you don't have to worry about it as much because you got a deployment bag. But man, as soon as you get rid of that deployment bag in all kinds of situations, these parachutes behave differently. Uh, getting a square parachute to line stretch all at the same time with even tension on the lines is very important. If you can do that, the consistency of your opening will be better. Uh, and I think what happens uh, when you uh, sometimes when during deployment, the tail lags behind, gets a little bit of slack in the control lines. And then as that slider is coming down, it kind of forces a knot because everything has to go through that one grommet. And um, it, it, it gives you a tension knot. Uh, so uh, you know, I think that's how it's happening. It's really difficult or impossible to re recreate. Um, uh, you know, I've seen an article recently that you know tries to uh, demyth some of the uh, you know oh it's because your you know control lines have you know two three twists in it. Nah, I don't think that's it. I think it has a lot more to do with the there being slack in the system, usually in the control lines. And it, it gets forced to a place via the slider, and it kind of half hitches uh, around it. Uh, um, I'm glad the conversation also occasionally goes. So if one happens, what should you do? Um, you know, I know I've got my plan of attack. If it ever happens to me, I don't know if it's going to work, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to enact my emergency procedure for it and keep my fingers crossed that it, that it works. It, it would be nice if we, could, if we could force them and then we'd find out if you know, these emergency procedures that I think some people have uh, are legitimate. Um, but, would you, would you uh, share yeah. that with us? What are your EPs? Yeah, I'm 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 gonna I'm going you know and I'm gonna try to stall this baby out. I'm gonna try to you know get zeroed out in my harness to to get to put slack right back in. See if I can do it. Most of the time, when people land with a tension knot, you walk over to it, and as soon as it's in the ground, it kind of releases itself. Keep tension on it, and it's gonna stay a knot. Release all that tension. I think you have a good chance of it of it freeing itself. Not I'm not certainly not saying a hundred percent of the time, but I think that that's going to be my direction. I'm going to rear riser stall, try to really get the canopy just to just to you know give up, just put slack everywhere in those lines, and then hopefully as it comes back around and I'm letting up, it's gone. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know if it ever works. I hope you don't have to. I've got a question about. Uh the like kind of culture of the manufacturers and you kind of alluded to the fact earlier that you'd worked with other manufacturers about improving product design um, and certainly there are problems with you know base jumping that everyone would like to solve what's the culture like in the manufacturing world is it like f1 driving where everyone's trying to keep their you know industry secrets to themselves or is it more uh, collaborative where all of you are kind of coming together to share product design and details and uh, safety information um yeah that's a that's a tough question i think uh, the culture's changed a little bit i think it's gotten a, a bit more competitive um I think on the safety side of things, I think we're all still, uh, you know, very much willing to to share with one another anything that is a, a concern for the safety of our participants. You know, I have no problem, you know, sharing if, if there's, you know, if there's something going on, you know, occasionally we share, you know, like we just got this phone call from someone that shouldn't be base jumping and they want to buy gear you might want to think twice if so and you know so we've had you know share that kind of information trying to protect you know our ourselves and our community and and our fragile uh you know connection to objects that that we have um uh, you know uh i i know the i've always enjoyed uh, the parachute industry association um uh a, a approach they seem to you know work really well together we're not as big it does that does 
give us a, a, a severe disadvantage. We don't have the you know the a market like the skydiving industry does, especially when you add the military portion in there. Um, so you know, uh, I, I think for the most part, uh, we you know, you know. We're never going to really share designs uh, and stuff. That's not realistic. But I think con to continue to share uh, uh, areas uh, of safety concern, uh, I, I I would hope and 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 think that we 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 do. You know, if 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 there's bad stuff out there, uh, or if there were things that you know someone was using, we would try to to share and contact them directly and say, hey, we had some a bad experience with X Y Z. You know, whether it be a, a material or uh, um, a technique or, or anything like that, I, I think that is, would still be there. Uh, but as far as you know, design and stuff, yeah, that's normal. We're not gonna not gonna share that. But uh, emergency and 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 um, uh, uh, and safety things, I I, I I think we we can. We have a, a good enough community that we can share it with those who are teaching. And um, and hopefully continue to grow on that a bit and have a little bit more central teaching. I think is going to be one of those things. Uh, we've got some a lot of people doing good stuff, but you know, making sure that we're all kind of playing the same thing. Before we go into teaching and stuff, maybe I'd like to, in a very friendly way, push back a little bit on that. And I would specifically the upper MLW tearing issue was uh, was was going on uh, throughout several manufacturers and was that something that you guys were sharing as an industry that you were running into that problem um uh, you say the upper uh so upper main lift web of a harness yeah i, I do remember uh, a couple people having separations there um we never had a complete separation we've seen some busted stitches in in that uh in that junction yeah uh, the complete failures. Um, oh, that's I, I honestly I don't remember. I th I felt like the community was pretty quick at at, at getting that information out. Uh, you know, um, uh, I believe. Sorry, I didn't one of them, want to say complete failure. I w just we knew that there were stitches that were coming out, and and I had seen it on multiple manufacturers. And I don't think that that was common knowledge uh, throughout the community until there was one particular incident that happened that was, uh, you know, pretty scary. Uh, so I, I wonder, since that's like the one experience that I can think of where there was a technique that everybody was using that then later changed industry wide. And I, I'm not sure that the information was actually shared by, by manufacturers at that point. I, I don't believe the manufacturers were sharing uh, on that one. I don't recall, you know, anything in, in that regard. Uh, I do believe that there was an assumption that all of those were created the same, and that's, uh, I think, where it was incorrect. It, um, a lot of it boiled down to uh, the material that the confluence wrap that that wraps that junction uh, was made of. Um, uh, if your confluence wrap isn't of uh, structural integrity, then you run a higher risk, even though you, you run a risk of, of a complete failure. Um, I know with, with our system, we had had a, a few of them that popped some stitches, which is kind of a a tattletale, you know, it's uh, it's it's letting you know that there's some issue here, and I'm sure if we would have been using a different confluence wrap, we could have had complete failures there. You know, I don't know, but basically the system kind of did what it was supposed to do. It relied back on that confluence wrap to maintain integrity, uh, and again, uh, we basically re-engineered uh, our stitch patterns uh, in that area. Uh, but kept all of the structural pieces, but just had a new stitch pattern, and we haven't seen the same issue. I know that other manufacturers took different approaches, you know, redesigned uh, harnesses uh, where that, you know, was was a different factor. Um, so I, 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 like, so I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I think it sheds a little bit of light on it. Moving uh, forward, uh, Todd, we'd like to jump back into some of your personal jumping. Um, you know, you started jumping 
before I was even really born. And uh, since then, I uh, have accrued, you know, several careers worth of jumps, you know, and uh, I know that there's also a period in there that you stop jumping altogether. Uh, can you take us through kind of the progression of your jumping, like when you were jumping the most and then uh, when you decided to take a break? Sure. Uh, yeah, so probably uh, most of my uh, active uh, years were in, in the 90s. Uh, I had another kind of resurgence uh, when I got back uh, into jumping after being out for about 10 years. Uh, the 10-year period was basically the 2000s. Uh, you know, uh, I think I laid off around 2002. Uh, I think I made two jumps over the next 10 years, and then uh, must have been somewhere around 12 that uh, 11 2011 2012 that I just uh, felt the time was right. It basically involved uh, my wife passing away. Uh, uh, my wife passed away in 2001, uh, and she, we ha together we had a four-year-old and an eight-year-old. Um, I went to Norway one more time uh, after she passed away, and I, I it was the first time that I just didn't enjoy it. I just could not. Uh, uh, relax in free fall. I couldn't relax at the exit point. I, I it just it 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 felt totally different. Uh, I just didn't enjoy it, and it was just because I knew I didn't have her backing me up. You know, we had we had made plans that if you know uh, doing what I do, if I wasn't around, she would know how to uh, continue on without me and raise these two boys. So when she died, it was just, it was different. So I, uh, like I said, kind of tried it one more time, wasn't into it. So I took time off and stayed in the base community, continued to run the company, got really into understanding a lot more about uh, uh, business, uh, about design. Uh, we uh, got into uh, a, a, CAD, a CAD cam style uh, machine that now was able to cut canopies rather than hand cutting. Uh, so we had a lot of other expansion and I, I stayed very interested in doing a lot of uh, just different things, uh, even though I wasn't uh, actively jumping at that time. And once my kids got older, I basically could talk to them and say, hey, by the way, this is something that dad, you know, that, you know, dad's involved in parachutes. They, they grew up with them. Um, and I said, I miss it. And uh, if you guys are okay with it, I'd like to, to, to get back into it. And they were like, oh, yeah, sure, no worries. Uh, and then, How old uh, were they at this point when uh, you had this talk? Yeah, so uh, probably like 14 and 17, 13 maybe, 13 and 17. So I was able to talk to them, and they went to uh, my new wife. Uh, I, I remarried a couple of years uh, after my first wife passed away, and we all went out to the Prine, and, uh, and uh, that was probably the most nerve-wracking exit, uh, you know, hugs and kisses. I love you, Dad. I love you, too. Oh, no. you know, it's like, oh. Uh, so after the first one, it was a little bit easier. Then they just, you know, said, okay, you, you go do your thing. And uh, so, yeah, it was uh, a nice way to kind of come back and, and uh, uh, yeah, and then got pretty busy again in those, in those years, did several European trips and, and uh, you know, continued to be semi-active. Always want a little bit more, and, but uh, do what I can. I'm curious because there's a lot of dads out there too and, and moms that are, that are jumping. And uh, we've actually had quite a few questions sent to us about this, about thoughts about being parents while jumping. Did your, yeah, right? Big yeah. eyes. Just, just, Todd just his eyes went real big, and yeah, it's a. Uh, it adds a lot of complexity to the sport for sure. I know it has for me, and it has for my wife. And I'm wondering, just from your experience there, you got back to, into it after 10 years. Were there anything like did was your new wife like uh, you knew that you could rely on her at that point to help raise your children if if you weren't going to be around, or you knew that your kids weren't going to be in an orphanage if you were if you checked out, or or or, or what was it that May, gave you the idea that you were going to be able to relax at the exit point and in free fall again? Yeah, um, it was uh, a lot of those factors. So I felt my kids were old enough that not that they wouldn't uh, miss me if I if I got hurt or died, but they weren't. It just was it was a different boat. You know, 10 years later, I have one that was just getting ready to graduate high school. And the other one was probably just getting into into high school. Um, you know, they were young adults, 
Uh, I could I could just talk to them, uh, you know, let them know that you know this is a part of me that I really feel is missing, and if I don't tell you about it uh, and try to rectify it, that you know, I'm going to be missing something, and, and it, that will probably start to reflect on, you know, the person I am, the, the father I could be. Uh, and if they both, or either one of them, would have said, look, Dad, that scares the shit out of me, I really wish you wouldn't do it until, you know, I would have, I would have honored that. Um, but, um, you know, I, I could see, I could, I think I could sense that, that they would be okay with it, and, uh, and just tried to be honest. Uh, so that was one thing, yes, I felt that they would be able to continue on. I felt that uh, uh, my wife Trisha would would could we could continue to help raise them, uh, and you know that everything would be okay. Yeah, I I, I might not be here, but you know you guys are going to be okay. One of the biggest changes was how I jumped. You know, I, I made a commitment to myself and to them that I just wasn't going to do stupid shit. You know. Uh, I don't know how many times I had gone somewhere. Oh, I want to. While I'm there, I'm going to make this many jumps, or while I'm there, I'm going to do this, you know, many different exit points, or I want to do this aerial or whatever. I, I I don't go on a trip with any of those things. My goal is coming home in one piece. Anything that happens in between is a bonus. You know, if I get weathered out the whole time, yeah, it's not great. I, it's that's a bummer, but I'm not going to go out and jump in crappy weather because. I got to make 10 jumps, you know, this trip or whatever the case may be. So I, I changed how I participated, which I thought was going to really reduce uh, the potential of getting hurt and or killed. Hey, no misconception. I know I can, both can still happen, but I think with, uh, with, a, with, with a desire not to be, uh, gets into something else, but uh, the desire not to be on the list, a desire not to be hurt, and and then act on that. Make sure you're making decisions that are based on that. You know, I, I, I'm way, way more reluctant to do two ways and three ways and ten ways. You know, it's just, you know, I, I got to make sure that who I'm jumping with, they're super solid, you know, those kinds of things. Hey, I'll just do a solo. I'm all right with that. I'm, it, it, there's, it's a different mindset. And I think that was one of the biggest things that when I realized I could participate like that, uh, it got easier. You know, I, I, I kind of uh, accepted the fact that uh, I'm a dad figure, and not just to my kids, but also to my participants and acting along those the best I can you know, to set good examples. Uh, uh, you know, so I think it was a mind shift as well. I really respect that, uh, all of what you just said, and I can relate to that uh, a lot. Recently, I went on a, on a jump with, uh, there was five of us, uh, no, there was about six of us. And um, there it's like a, a plateau and there's an upper exit and a lower exit and the lower exit is way less technical you know, you need to get your wingsuit flying and everything like that, but there's some margin for, a, you know, a small slip or, you know, maybe uh, rolling the, the, the windows on down as you're unbalanced or something like that. Whereas the upper exit is highly technical and you need to nail it or die. And, um, and it was me and uh, my friend Seb who went to the lower exit and we're both fathers and uh, I can't be, I mean, I have to be totally honest. Like I felt it hurt a little bit, you know, it was like, ah, you know, like ah, I want to get up there and get radical because, you know, you can dive into this, uh, this cool war and there's like a big section of terrain flying that you can do right before you meet the the lower exit. And I was torn, you know, it was like, I want to get radical with all the boys up there too. And, uh, but it, it, there was also a real sense of comfort knowing that I was doing the right decision for me at that time. And I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that the guys that went up higher, you know, uh, were making the wrong decision. It was just for me and Seb, it was the right decision. And, uh, I'm wondering, do you ever, you ever struggle with that? Do you ever, or, or are you steadfast in your Papa base? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I struggle with it a little bit, you know? There are times where you know I hear that you know I hear so and so's or you know I get invited on a load and I just you know you know between you know ah, I you know no sorry I'm, I'm not going to go I'm not current enough or you know uh, I you know I got 
you know, responsibilities, you know, that tomorrow morning that I, I need to take care of. I can't be out at 2 a.m., even though that's a really sweet building you guys are headed to. And I know you guys got 30 jumps off it in the last month, but I got I to gotta pass. Uh, I, yeah, I, I do miss those. There's no doubt. Um, and again, you know, uh, it, 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 it just comes back to, well, this is where I've put it for myself. This is where I get to participate, you know, um, and, uh, and I'm okay with that. It's, it's gotten a little easier, uh, you know, in, in the last 10 years to kind of, uh, you know, have that take. Uh, but, uh, in the beginning it was definitely a, a bit harder, but it's always, it's, 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 it's it, you know, it was really hard to step away. And then coming back, I really felt like I was I was getting something back, and so it did make it a little easier to say, okay, well, you've got back the participation. Now you got to just throttle through it and coast through it. That that you know, I don't have to be on that leading edge of of of, of the jumper profile anymore. I'm I'm okay with that. Yeah, I I kind of found the same thing as uh, the years went on. Of like you know the, the activity is is just as fun if you're doing it you know the second time the hundredth time that it's done you know the it doesn't very much it doesn't change very much uh, you know flying through the trees when like there are a hundred of your friends that have already ripped the line and done all the math uh, and you know learned the hard lessons uh, as it does if you're that first one through the gate. Uh, I'm kind of curious about your 10 year break and that's a, that's something that not a whole lot of people have done. I think the common, uh, trajectory is people do it hard for a while and then they quit. Uh, and very few of those people that quit even stay around the community. And so you've got a pretty unique perspective of somebody that has taken a long break, stayed engaged with the community the entire time and then come back to it. Uh, and so I'm particularly interested in, in what you observed during that 10 year period uh, in the base community and in yourself and your motivation to jump. I, I, I just love the community. I, I love what it's been able to provide for me. Um, you know, I, I got more involved, like I said, in, in business uh, in, and, uh, you know, for the longest time, you know, we, we we knew how to build something, build a pilot shoot. Uh, but then trying to hand that off, uh, not having really good detailed instructions on on what needs to get done between point A to getting it to final QC. So there was a lot of things that were just missing, and it really gave me an opportunity to uh, uh, you know let my you know, my brain go and say, okay, let's, let's, let's work this through. Uh, let's, uh, let's get a, 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 a CAD cam cut table uh, that can keep all the patterns, you know, digitally and, and run and you tell it to go and cut and it does. Uh, that expanded our capabilities a lot for new designs. Uh, hiring uh, uh, engineers that could uh, run uh, programs on our airfoils to see where we could get more efficient. Um, which we did do and, and, and kind of made a big step in our company from, you know, the, the original Flick to the, to the Lobo and then ultimately the Flick 2 uh, using, you know, science and people that are a lot smarter than I am that have the programs where they can, you know, run all these uh, tests and, and help us, you know, engineer a, a better product. Uh, and then being able to consistently manufacture. And, you know, I've, 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 I've spent, you know, I've got volumes of, of, of instructions on how to put different things together that now I can share with uh, my employees to make sure that we're consistent and how we're not, not just the consistency, you know, in the finished product, but how we get there, that we're all doing the same thing, that we, we're not changing things midway or you've got your way of doing it and he's got his way. There's always going to be a little bit of that, but man, you really want to make sure that nothing is missed, nothing is skipped. That's something that our industry, our sport, our customers, you know, demand. And uh, that was, you know, one of the big things that, you know, being where we are, we we realized it was a responsibility of ours. We take a lot of uh, a responsibility that's not forced on us. You know, we have no regulation, right? Base jumping has no regulations. Where we get to manufacture kind of anything we want, any way we want. No one says anything, but we still have a lot of responsibility. That doesn't mean it's just a free for all. 
We have to have buy from really good, reputable manufacturers our raw materials and make sure that they're coming in. So expanding on all that really gave me something fun to do for 10 years. I really dug on that. And today I still do. I'll geek out on writing a, 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 a manual, you know, and, and making sure it's got the details that we want and taking pictures and, and you know, and all that. And so it, 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 I just, I just changed my focus. I, I, I am kind of a gear nerd. Uh, and, uh, I love, I love parachutes. I'll still pack just kind of for fun. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. We, you know, get a, a new size canopy or a new size container and I get to go, you know, pack it the first time and see how, you know, how that combination works out. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I, I really have continued to enjoy, uh, you know, our community and, and trying to trying to see it grow um, trying to make that pie bigger and 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 you know it's just it has been a lot of fun I, I i enjoy the teaching it's one of the things i i miss probably the most i, I enjoyed being a skydive instructor uh, aff in tandem i really enjoyed that i enjoyed teaching uh, base jumping kind of handed that over to marta and jimmy for several years uh and uh but I, I still enjoy that. I still enjoy the interaction and, and sharing uh, new stuff. So how about, um, it sounds like you rechanneled those motivations into just cutting edge technology, which we've been talking about for you know pretty much the whole episode. Um, and the second part to my question was, what about observations of the community? Not a whole lot of people spend as much time as you have engaged with the community and not jumping. You know, the community, I, I haven't seen a lot of change with the exception of uh, just volume. I think uh, for the most part, it's it's still exciting. The community still comes together and enjoys uh, one another and, and, and ultimately wants to see success uh, in their fellow jumpers. Um, so I, I haven't, I don't, it's not like I can say, oh, you know, we were a smaller group back then, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah, it was a much smaller group. But the friendships that, 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 that we had are very similar to the friendships that I see you guys have with your own groups or that when I, you know, show up in Moab or uh, the Prine or in Arizona, it, it you know, that's the same. People, we, we trust each other a, a lot. Um, uh, to, to you know to, to have our back to come get us if we fuck up and we're laying down somewhere you know, you know they're going to come back and and and, and help you uh, and if they see you messing up they're going to you know try to point you in the right direction so I, I think a lot of that has uh, stayed obviously they just keep getting younger <laughs> you know it's just like okay I, 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 I can deal with that so it's um, uh, yeah, I, I I haven't noticed just some you know remarkable difference, but I've noticed that uh, you know that it's a lot of the same uh, uh, desires. Obviously, we get to travel a lot more. Uh, it, it, I think it is maybe a little uh, easier than it was uh, because the the information is 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 there. Uh, we have matured a lot. We have a lot of people that are going to to ground schools and they're trying to get good educations. Uh, and how to make a safe transition, um, and, and then what they do with it is kind of up to them. But at least we see a majority of the people that are getting into the sport. They're not just banditing out out there. They're not following from the drop zone like I did blindly to some object with gear that okay, I hope this works. Uh, I, I think you know for the most part we're we're trying to pass the buck responsibly to the next people coming up because we have learned a lot and. Yeah. The internet is in some regard a double-edged sword in that it leads us to these ideas of getting radical and then there's also this side of a lot of available information. Um if you had a magic wand uh, that you could wave that would get everybody in line to be more responsible while getting out there and and getting radical. What how could you see our community evolving in a more responsible and uh, sportsmanlike uh, way? Mm. And I don't mean cutting out the fun. Don't get it twisted. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, you know, how can we reduce these stupid accidents? 
I wish I knew. I, I really do. Uh, I think, um, you know, finding people that are, uh, have, have been doing it a while and trying to, like you guys are, you're, you're trying to pick some people's brains. They're like, how do we do this? Uh, I think right now a, a, a general consensus uh, is it takes time to get to the place that, especially like you guys are, you know, avid wingsuit pilots that can fly off of mountains. That looks real easy, but it's really not. It takes time, commitment, dedication, uh, skill that takes time and dedication to, to develop. So, I, I, you know, I, I used to just throw a simple slow down. It's, it's, it's more than that. It's make sure your investments are, 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 are planting seeds so that those roots can get strong. Make sure that your, your skydiving and your, your preparations aren't hurried, aren't rushed. They're going to take years. It's going to take you years from the time you start skydiving till you're flying off of big mountains looking cool. It, 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 and if you shortcut it, it it's probably not going to end well. Man, maybe a couple people have got away with it. But in the, in the long run, that activity just takes a lot of time and dedication. And you can get there, but it, it just takes the time. Speaking of time. Uh, we are almost out of time on this interview and man, we could talk for hours to you about all of the great innovations that have come out of Apex and the preceding companies and all of the history. And I hope you come back, uh, to do that because there are some really cool things, uh, in, in the Apex and your history that have informed how everyone jumps and how we like use equipment and what equipment we use. But, uh, on also the note of time, I'd like to know what impact you are hoping to get uh, from all of the time that you've engaged in the sport. I mean, you've basically devoted your entire life to it. And, you know, dissimilar to most of us, you engage with the general public on a regular basis. So it's not just a mark that you're leaving on the base jumping community, but, you know, on society as a whole by choosing to spend, you know, decades innovating, uh, and educating in this, in this realm. Uh, so again, the, the question is what kind of mark, uh, were you looking to leave on society by devoting yourself to base jumping? I certainly didn't think of that, uh, at all. Uh, uh, so, uh, now you're making me think about it. Uh, I don't know if I'll have a, a really good response. Um, yeah, I'm like most of us, I was living in the moment most of the time uh, and have continued to kind of try to, to do that, um, uh, you know, be, be good to, to our, our community as parachutists in, in the big picture and uh, our smaller base jumping community. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not really sure, uh, you know, how I want to be remembered kind of, kind of thing. Um, I, I've been here for the sport. I've loved it. I really have. I've enjoyed the people that I've, I've been able to meet and and in uh, the places I've been able to see. Uh, I definitely feel very blessed in that regard. That you know it, that you know something worked and and planets aligned so that I could I could have this path, uh, and uh, um, and just feel fortunate that uh, I've been able to continue to to do what I really do love to do, and it's just trying to make this crazy you know, sport that we participate in, uh, as safe and, and as repeatable as, as, as we can and, you know, provide, you know, good solid, you know, product and advice and, and services, uh, you know, that we can, you know, kind of hang our hat on and, and, and say, we, we, we tried our best. Uh, we, we really did, uh, and, and hope we haven't fallen short too many times. Well, I can say that uh, I'm very fortunate to have met you uh, back when I did. You know, it's uh, very common for our society to tell you what you can't do. And it's uh, pretty rare to find somebody that will tell you not only that you can do something, but how to do it. Uh, and so, like, I appreciate that mark that you've left on uh, our community and society as uh, somebody that's willing to hold the line for radical and dangerous and amazing behavior 
uh, you know, and uh, devote their life to creating some kind of structure where in which that can be done sustainably. Well, thanks. Uh, um, I appreciate that. That's very nice. Todd, I've really enjoyed this conversation and thank you for all your innovations. Hey, well, guys, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate the invite. Um, uh, if there's ever anything else you, you want to talk about, hopefully this uh, gets edited and works out and you've got something you can use in there. And, uh, yeah, I really appreciate, uh, you know, the time and the opportunity. And so, yeah, keep me posted if there's anything else. And I uh, hope to see you uh, again, Matt and uh, Laurent. I hope to get to meet you sometime. Uh, and, uh, yeah, if there's everything I can do, let me know. Great. Perfect. As soon as we hit the stop button on the recording, we got launched into some very interesting conversations, so decided to start recording again, and this is what ensued. I'm curious of how you guys and maybe other people would feel uh, about the base fatality list. Uh, lately, I've, I've had this really weird connection with it. So for my entire career, you know, or not maybe the entire career, probably I think it got originally published in the 90s. You know, I, I, I go back you know, numerous times and, and look at it and, and visit old friends, you know, and, and get to see their photos. And, and, um, and, and you know, and we tell every new base room, go read the fatality list. There's a lot to learn there. And lately I've been like, are, are we creating something that is uh, a desire to end up on? Yeah. Yeah. Have we canonized I, it, all of these people? Yeah. I mean, why wouldn't I want to be on a list with Jimmy and v, JVH and 300 other, 400 other people on that list? I've got good friends in there. I've got some of the just the most you know friendly, fun, talented people I've ever met in my life are on this fucking list. And it's like, you know, I don't think we have, but it, it it's this little thing in the back of my mind. It's like, you know, if we... You know, parachutists, they, they use it for learning. They don't put names. They don't put pictures. They just say, this is what happened. And it's like, ah, yeah, I could, I, I could see that because have we created something that's like, no, you know, if I get on the list, oh, well, I'm with some good people. You know, yeah. I just, oh. and, and you get your sticker and you get your party and you get to re be remembered forever, forever and forever, you know, read about by every base jumper that comes after you. And, and even uh, even better, if my number is something that is like remarkable, you know, 420. Yeah. Who would have thought? Right. right? Yeah. And uh, a lot of so people were just, talking about that. I know. They were like yeah. discussing who was going to be number 420 and like there were a bunch of message board hits on, you know, uh, taking the number intentionally. That's interesting. <laughs> I've never really thought about it in that way. And, and you asked us what what was the like the chatter has been like. And, and I can say from my personal perspective and from other people that I've been speaking with is that the, it's incomplete. You know, it's oh, yeah. usually it's it, there's so much more information to be gathered. And there's so much more uh, about the incidents itself, like the weeks, months leading up to the accident and all the details that uh, were involved. And uh, and then following that is also do we need to post it right away? And do we need to put something, uh, someone's picture up before we have all the details? And uh, I think that that's something that we can argue around in circles. And, and I'm not convinced that we need to have it up instantly anymore because I feel like we've just learned all the lessons already. You know, it's, it, we're not, I'm sure that there's more lessons to be learned, but it's not like in 2016. It's, it's not like you know, people drop in every one every day or multiple people a day. And, and I think that we do have the room to take pause and make sure we've got everything right before that, that picture goes up. Yeah. 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 There's definitely, uh, you know, something to think about. And I think letting people know that people are still dying, you know, having a list and uh, getting more correct proper uh, detailed information uh it, you know it would be a responsibility so i'm not trying to say that we should cancel it or anything like that yeah. it's been a it's been an interesting thing through our history but i've definitely recently started to have just a different 
relationship with this list that I've, you know, just, you know, kind of cherished. I, yeah, I, I, you know, like I said, I've got friends on there. I go back and visit them and, and stuff, so. Well, it's, it's much more public now. And on the canonization issue, like, I can tell you from my perspective, we have reduced uh, the, we've reduced the, the, the pain of the worst case scenario here. Like if the worst case scenario in base jumping is that you die, right? And that's it. Your life ends, gone, right? That's pretty harrowing. Uh, though the worst case scenario here is that you died and become a legend uh, of sorts. Right. Right. And so like, you know, does it, does it push people to do something more dangerous, more reckless, not care as much that the uh, worst case scenario isn't as bad as somewhere else? Perhaps does it even attract people that would have taken their lives in another way and all they care about is to be recognized for one moment. And if that moment comes in base jumping, then okay. Because certainly right. we've created a space where in which people have the agency to end their life and uh, the support to end their life in any way they, they choose fit to you know, choose to do it. Like we have a uh, pretty unconditional positive regard for anyone, even if they made an intentional mistake at the end. So the, the, yeah, yeah the ingredient missing is the misery that is left behind. You know, when you flip right. through that list and read, you don't see, you know, the girlfriends, wives, mothers, sons, daughters, you know, who are left in shambles. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and this, I think, like what you were saying before, this canonization of people that are on the list hides the fact that, you know, there's destruction in the wake of those impacts. And it's, it's unfortunate that uh, we can't see a, a bigger picture. Though still, even the impacts are something, you know, like if, if somebody is uh, struggling to find space in the world, then any impact is uh, enticing, even if it's a negative impact. And so sure. like, uh, the, I mean, there are reported cases of uh, people who have committed suicide uh, whose old, like last wish was that just somebody acknowledged them on the way to wherever they were going. And if one person acknowledged them on the way to whatever object they were going to jump off of, they would have turned around and not done it. Right. And so like, this is our, our a default way for those people to get acknowledgement no matter what. Uh, and so it, that's, it's a really difficult and interesting thing that you bring up, Todd, like, are, are we, uh, are we allowing for that space? And if we are allowing for that space, is it wrong? I I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I'm not going to judge on on that. It was. Yeah. I, yeah. Right. I have to think like, about it a lot more to 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 be able to make that call. But yeah, you know. It's, um, I mean, my hope is yeah. that people end up so on you guys the are, list. You guys are uh, understanding trying the, to push the, the limits and making mistakes, not intentionally going for the list. Uh, yeah, and I don't, I don't know. Maybe you, you, you know of situations where you know someone might actually be intentionally going for it. I, I don't know if I'm willing to, to, to go that far and to think that that's what's happening, but, but possibly not having the, 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 the impact that we think reading a list like that might have. It's like, well, you know, if I, at least if I go this way, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, yeah, going for totally. whatever, you know, I'm gonna, that, that, there, there I am. And, uh, uh, so, you know, yes, yeah, certainly I think there take, should be take, some more take philosophy. With it what you want. Yeah. There should be some more philosophy added into it. I mean, like if you, if you think about it from a new jumper's perspective, I, and I was this jumper for sure, I was reading down the list and I was just reading a bunch of mistakes that I was never going to make, you know, because I'd read them. And so I was better than them. And so like I could avoid all those mistakes and I was better than all these people. And it turns out that like Laurent is incredibly correct that like the list is incredibly incomplete as to what actually caused those things. And so I was lent, I was getting a lot of false confidence reading this incomplete list, thinking that I was going to avoid all of these, you know, tragedies. And at the same time, I was probably also subconsciously getting some, uh, confidence, uh, behind the fact that like, if, uh, the worst case happened and I were to go in, at least somebody would remember me. It would not be a life lost. And those two points definitely give uh, more confidence 
and courage than should be uh, warranted uh, for any new jumper. Yep, exactly. Exactly. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Exit Point. As usual, thank you to Mark Stockwell for his co-production and sound editing. I don't know where we'd be in this project without him. And thanks to all of you who've been sending your messages and emails. Your energy and support have really fueled this project, so please keep them coming. Good or bad, we want to hear from you. Our contacts are in the description below. Until next time.